The policies put forth by President Obama and congressional Democrats have yielded more government spending, but have failed to generate strong economic growth and the jobs Americans need. Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. Chairman's correct. The chair would ask members to cease conversations and uh, remove their conversations from the floor. Gentleman from Michigan. Instead of lowering unemployment, we got a lower credit rating. Instead of massive job creation, we got massive and unprecedented levels of debt. And instead of higher wages for working families, we got higher gas prices. This bill provides real relief to American small businesses and the workers they employ. And it treats every small business equally. Contrary to the political cronyism we've seen time and time again, this bill does not pick winners and losers. It provides relief to all small businesses, including those in my home state of Michigan. Michigan's been hit especially hard over the last three years with some of the highest unemployment rates in the nation. And while small business owners in my district need and want comprehensive tax reform, they also agree that we must take steps to spur investment and hiring today as well. These business owners are the real experts who know what they need to add jobs back to our communities. Take, for example, Bob Yackel, president of Merrill Tools. As part of the 400-employee Merrill Technologies Group, Mr. Yackel says, and I quote, as a manufacturing business in mid-Michigan, we know firsthand the ramifications of the recent economic turmoil. The best way Washington can help energize economic growth is by making sure business owners are spending less on tax payments and more on creating jobs. Bob Yackel is a larger small business owner, but there are smaller businesses that feel the same way. Jim Holton, owner of Mountain Town Station in Mount Pleasant, has served the central Michigan community as a restaurant owner for more than 15 years. He's especially pleased with the simplicity and ease of this legislative approach. He says the beauty of the Small Business Tax Cut Act is its simplicity. If you're earning profits and contributing to the economy, then you can take 20% off your tax bill. No hoops to jump through. This is a great way for business owners like myself in the Great Lakes Bay region and across America to help jumpstart our economy. Those are just two examples in Michigan's 4th District, but they echo small businesses and the small business owners across the country. Throughout our history, we've depended upon these industrious and innovative risk takers to help us move through tough economic times. And while we work to provide them the long-term, comprehensive tax reform they need, we can also take steps today to unlock new opportunities for them immediately. Passing this bill will provide these much-needed immediate opportunities. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting small business and to demonstrate that they support them as well by voting yes on H.R. 9. And Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Cantor, be permitted to control the balance of the time, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time without objection. Mr. Cantor will control the time and have the authority to dispense time. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I yield myself such time as I shall consume. Uh, this bill needs to be graded, and the grade it uh, gets is F, a fat F grade. It fails all tests of sound tax policy. Let me start with truth in advertising, a grade F. This is not a small business bill. It's small business in name only. It's totally untargeted, totally. It applies as long as an entity has under 500 employees, oh, law firms, sports teams, financial consultants, lobbyists, corporate farmers, and regardless of what their annual receipts are, they can be tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Interestingly, when the SBA uh, looks at its loan program, it has what's called a common standard. And what that is, that generally the businesses it serves cannot have more than seven million in annual, average annual receipts for most non-manufacturing firms. This bill has no limits, none as to function or amount of receipts. So really this bill mocks the use of the title small business. This isn't about mom and pop. 
It's about popping the cork for wealthy taxpayers. So, secondly, graded on tax fairness, F. According to the most cautious estimate, 56 percent of the tax break under this bill goes to taxpayers making 250,000 or more annually. It provides 125,000 taxpayers making $1 million a year with a tax break of over 58,000. And another model says that 49% of this $46 billion revenue loss goes to people with incomes over $1 million. This is Bush tax cuts on steroids. Thirdly, in terms of job creation, another grade F. Listen to the Joint Tax Committee analysis. It says this bill's economic impact, I quote, is so small as to be incalculable. So small as to be incalculable. The only thing calculating about this bill is its political nature. You know, we've looked at the uh, website of uh, the majority leader. Uh, he uses uh, Mr. Robbins, who um, was the one who advised Herman Cain on 999. And so here's what Mr. Robbins says about uh, this bill. He estimates that a one-year tax cut would create 39,000 jobs. This is on the majority leader's website. So according to the analysis that the leader is touting on his own website, H.R. 9 would increase the federal deficit by $1.1 million for every job supposedly created. So another big F. Now let's talk about uh, where these jobs would be created. The bill doesn't it's so untargeted require that the jobs that are created here would really be created because a company would get this benefit if it sheds jobs or if it uses the deduction to hire workers overseas. All right, let's next go to fiscal irresponsibility. Another fat F in terms of responsibility. This bill adds a whopping $46 billion, $46 billion to the deficit in one year. And if it's made permanent, one half trillion dollars over the next 10 years. So I say this to anybody who votes for this bill and then goes home and utters the word once, federal deficit. They will sell short the intelligence of their constituents because they'll know when someone is selling them a pig in a poke. Now let's talk about tax reform. Another fat F. This bill is the antithesis of tax reform. And what it does is ridicule supporters who claim their fealty to tax reform. It doesn't simplify tax structures, it complicates it. And that's why I quote the Wall Street Journal this morning. This is what they say about your bill. It's another tax gimmick. Just earlier today, somebody got up here and read from the Wall Street Journal of some months ago. Again, the Wall Street Journal says the U.S. economy does not need another tax gimmick, gimmick, end of quotes. So this is tax policy gone haywire. So I'm going to offer a substitute after we finish debate here on uh, general debate that's targeted, that will help create jobs, that's fair, that is fiscally responsible and continues a policy that 
both Republicans and Democrats have supported in the past. This flies in the face of anything bipartisan. It flies in the face of anything that is truthful in advertising. It flies in the face of anything that is fair. It flies in the face of anything that creates jobs. It flies in the face of fiscal responsibility and it flies in the face of tax reform. So I more than urge people vote no and vote yes on our substitute. I really urge that um, they exercise their responsibility uh, to try to get this country moving in the right direction, not with policies that deserve a total F on the test of sound tax policy. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Cantor, the Majority Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself uh, as much time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, we know jobs won't come back until small businesses recover. Small businesses have generated over 65 percent of the new jobs in this country. But the economic downturn, red tape, and higher taxes coming from Washington have simply made it harder for small business to create jobs. Tax policy should encourage economic growth, investment, and job creation, not stifle it. We need to stop thinking about what kind of country we want to be. We need to stop and think about what kind of country we want to be. And we want to be one with lower taxes, more growth, and more jobs. Or do we want to be one of more government control and fewer opportunities? This week, when every American filed their tax returns, the other party in the Senate voted to increase taxes. We should not be taking money out of the hands of those we are counting on to create jobs. We need to let small business owners keep more of their hard-earned money so they can start hiring again. Today, Mr. Speaker, we'll vote on the Small Business Tax Cut Act to give every small business with less than 500 employees a 20% tax cut. Our bill puts more money into the hands of small business owners so they can reinvest those funds to retain and create more jobs and grow their businesses. Plain and simple. According to a study, the Small Business Tax Cut Act will help create more than 100,000 new jobs a year once fully in place. One third of the firms that benefit from our tax cut are owned by women. One fifth are owned by minorities. And our legislation won't just benefit small business owners, it benefits current workers by boosting wages. Mr. Speaker, when I talk with small business owners across the country, I hear they need more opportunity to grow. I hear the taxes are siphoning away their income. I hear they can't access capital. One small business owner in Spotsylvania, Virginia, called the small business tax cut a win-win for him and other small business owners in the economy. He said that with more money to invest in his businesses, he could afford to hire more staff, buy new equipment, and expand. Mr. Speaker, while we continue to work toward tax reform that broadens the base, brings down the rates for everybody, and gets rid of loopholes that Washington, would, Washington assumes the role of picking winners and losers, we need to take incremental steps to give job creators tax relief right away. This Small Business Tax Act is a step in that right direction. President Obama called small businesses the anchors of our main streets. We agree. I hope we can all unite around helping the small businesses, which are the engines of job creation in our country. And Mr. Speaker, I'd say in response to the gentleman's assertion uh, towards the definition of small business in this bill, this is the Small Business Administration definition of small business. This is what every program that comes out of this government aimed to help small businesses is premised upon. The SBA definition of a small business is those of 499 or less. And as far as the gentleman's allegations about the potential for abuse under this bill, 
if he'd read the language of the bill, Mr. Speaker, it caps the ability to benefit from the tax cut to 50% of the W-2 wages that that small businesses pays out. This is straight up something to help small businesses keep more of their money while they're having so much difficulty keeping the lights on and instead giving them the ability to grow, to grow, invest, and create more jobs. And as far as the gentleman's allegations that somehow this bill only affects those millionaires, billionaires, and the rest, I think he will see the studies have shown that just 18.3% of those people in the categories of income he suggests with 80-some percent in the middle class, 80-some percent the true small business owners who we're relying on to create jobs for the middle class to come back. And I would say to the gentleman, as far as the uh, allegation of gimmickry, the essence of supply-side economics, the centrality issue on taxes is the reduction of marginal rates. That's exactly what this bill does. Does it provide it for long enough? Does it provide permanency? No. But what we want to do in a permanent way is affect broader tax reform. But since we can't see eye to eye on that, since we still got work to do, let's give the small businesses some help now. With that, I yield, I, I reserve the rest of my time, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman reserves, gentlemen from I yield myself 30 seconds. Gentleman's recognized. We have a statement of administration policy in total opposition to this. The Small Business Administration would not provide a loan for innumerable people who benefit from this. They have a seven million limit. Supply side economics, we tried that for a number of years and we're, we're losing 700,000 jobs a month when this administration took over. 700,000 and you raise supply side economics as something we should uh, uh, embrace? No way, no way. I yield now three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Washington, a member of our committee, Mr. Dr. Jim McDermott. Gentleman from Washington. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, members of the House, in five hours we're going to get on planes and go home, so we have to get the press releases ready to go. And that's what this is about. This bill will be dead in the Senate the minute it hits the desk. It's not going anywhere. It is a press release, and it is the most wasteful bill of the season so far. Now, I, I'm sure that Mr. Cantor and others will find worse things to do down the way as we get closer to the election. This week has been a disaster in here. We started on Tuesday by deeming the budget passed here and in the Senate. It's a fiction. It never happened. That's how this week started. Then we went to the Ways and Means Committee yesterday, and we cut $68 billion out of health, children's services, social services, foster care, in reconciliation to balance the budget. And then we get up this morning, and here we have a bill that borrows $46 billion from the Chinese or whoever to give it to small business. The fact is that 125,000 millionaires in this country will get an average tax cut of $58,000. That's what this bill does. It does not create jobs. It's supposed to create jobs. In fact, the job creation is so small, as you heard, it's incalculable. Now, that wouldn't satisfy the majority leader. He had to go and find an economist somewhere who would give him a better number. So he found Herman Cain's guy, the guy who had the 999 tax deal. Now, there's a solid citizen. He really knows what's going. Well, he comes up with 39,000 jobs will be created. 39,000 jobs. Sounds like quite a bit, doesn't it? Until you figure how many billions of dollars are going to create them. The figure is each job will cost $1.1 million in tax cuts to get one job. You think they're hiring somebody for $1.1 million? They're hiring them for $6 or $8 an hour. This is not a job creation bill. It is simply a press release. 
The Republicans have not brought out a serious job creation bill. Yesterday was as close as we came when we did finally the highway bill so we could at least keep highway infrastructure being created. But otherwise, there has been nothing solid that has gotten through the Congress. The highway bill will get through because everybody knows it creates jobs. But this kind of stuff is simply sinking us. What's really interesting, though, as I looked at that $1.1 billion per job, I remember when they came up with the phony claim, never proved, that the Recovery Act would cost $278,000 for a job. This loss is four times as much, and it's from his own economist. Gentleman's time Vote expired. Vote no on this bill. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I now yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Herrera Butler. Gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And last week I met with more than 70 small businesses throughout Southwest Washington. And I'm here to support a bill today that would give every one of those businesses a much needed positive injection of capital. What my friends on the other side of the aisle seem to have a hard time understanding is that seven out of ten jobs in this country over the last 20 years have come from small businesses. If we create an environment where they can grow and succeed, more people are going to find work. And that's what this is all about. They need it. My district has endured multiple years of double-digit unemployment. And job-providing small businesses haven't seen much from their government to give them hope or encourage them uh, to grow their workforce. For for example, many small businesses that I've met with are really worried about hitting that 50 employee threshold uh, that's going to trigger the health care law's burdensome costs. They're staying under it. Imagine that, a government rule that is deterring small businesses from hiring. This is a terrible time to send that message. Another business owner talked to me about how he's exasperated by the government reaching out to him saying he had four days to put together a mountain load of paperwork or face a fine. Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, the gentlelady an additional 30 seconds. Gentlelady is recognized. We need to remove those barriers, and today the bill that, we're, that we get a chance to pass is going to send a different signal that says government wants you to grow. We want you to hire. You're not Uncle Sam's piggy bank. We want you to succeed and prosper. This gonna, these businesses are going to put moms, dads, and hardworking taxpayers to work. Let's allow them to do more of that. And on behalf of small business owners in southwest Washington, I stand in strong support of this bill. Thank you. I yield back. Lady yields back. I yield myself five seconds. Right. Is it worth 1.1 million a job in Washington? I now yield two minutes to the very distinguished gentleman from Oregon and active member of our committee, Mr. Blumenauer. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you very much. I, I listened to my good friend and colleague from the other side of the river from my hometown of Portland, Oregon, uh, talking about trying to assist small business and encouraging economic development. But the facts are that the vast majority of this aid, as we've talked about, is going to be unfocused. It's going to go to people whether they need it or not, including some of the wealthiest individuals and uh, partnerships, uh, accountants, lobbyists, uh, and to companies regardless of whether or not they add employment or reduce it. At this very time, we have people on Capitol Hill who are begging us to get real about infrastructure investment. We finally are getting a, a bill to conference, but we're hung up on funding it. The Republican budget would cut transportation funding 46%, $6.5 billion less than is necessary to keep current obligations. This week, small business people, including a number who visited my office, came in imploring us to stop the games, get on with a reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act. If we really are going to borrow $46 billion from China or whomever and add to the deficit, if we have that capacity, for heaven's sakes, we should invest it in rebuilding and renewing America. This $46 billion added to the bipartisan Senate bill that passed with 74 votes, half the Republicans, uh, 
you take that money plus 46 billion, we could have a robust reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act, create hundreds of thousands of family wage jobs, seconds. Tom's recognized. create hundreds of thousands of family wage jobs, not picking winners and losers, but going back to the day when we used to work together on a bipartisan basis to fund infrastructure and help strengthen every community around the country. Reject this gimmick. If we have an extra $46 billion we're going to borrow, investing it in rebuilding and renewing America, really helping small business and strengthening the environment in every community across America. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Kansas, Ms. Jenkins. The lady from Kansas. I thank the leader for yielding. Job growth is my top priority, and no one can deny that small business is the engine that drives our economy and our job market. Since 1980, small businesses have accounted for 60% of job creation. Their success is vital to the strength of this economy and the availability of jobs for all Americans. As a CPA and a legislator, I've heard from small business owners throughout my career, and their message has been remarkably consistent. They need relief from the burdensome tax code, and they need capital to hire and expand, which is exactly what the Small Business Tax Cut Act provides. While our colleagues in the Senate are devising new and creative ways to raise taxes, here in the House we have the opportunity to pass legislation that supports our small businesses, encourages growth and job creation, and lifts our economy out of the current economics of the day. We can and should do all this by passing the Small Business Tax Cut Act today. I yield back. And the lady yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. You ready, Javier? I now yield uh, three minutes to another very active member of our committee, Mr. Bas uh, Becerra, Javier Becerra from California. Gentleman from California for three minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, when you hear about small business, what comes up in your mind first? The corner drugstore, the tech troubleshooting startup, my daughter's martial arts instructor. How about Donald Trump? Trump sales and leasing, or Paris Hilton entertainment. What about Larry Flint publications? Not that any of these latter companies have volunteered to show me their tax returns, but by all accounts, these are the businesses that will devour the lion's share of the tax breaks in this legislation. Mr. Speaker, 3% of the businesses in America will get 56% of the tax breaks provided. The rich and famous will get most of the money. 125,000 millionaires in America will get $58,000 in tax breaks this year alone, or in their first year of this tax break. That's how targeted this particular bill is. More than that, what we find is that most Americans don't believe that our tax system is fair. They believe that it is skewed towards the very wealthy. H.R. 9 proves that they are right. Seventy percent of Americans believe that the tax system is skewed against them and favors the very wealthy. Where, well, if Paris Hilton, who has what we understand is about five employees based in Beverly Hills, can take advantage of this tax cut, or Donald Trump, or Larry Flint, or Kim Kardashian, or Oprah Winfrey, all small business people, can take advantage and get maybe $58,000 in tax break, while most small businesses will get barely anything, then I think the American public is correct. Remember, most businesses in America are sole proprietorships. Most of those sole proprietorships have no employees. Under this bill, if you're a sole proprietor and have no employees, you get zero of the tax break benefits. Now, another example. Two companies, both have 500 employees. One company decides to hire more Americans. Ten more Americans are put on the payroll. The other company, 500 employees, decides, 
I think it's easier for me to make more money if I take some of those jobs and put them overseas. So I'm going to fire 10 Americans here in America and I'm going to start those jobs overseas, outsource those jobs. Guess who gets the tax break? Company that hires two, 10 new American employees? No, they get nothing. The, uh, the firm that fires 10 American employees here and outsources those jobs to another country, that company will get the benefits of this tax break. The American public is correct. Today's tax system is skewed towards the wealthy. And that's why we have to vote against this legislation. Let us have job creation legislation. Let us focus on small businesses. This does neither. I urge my colleagues to vote against H.R. 9. Tom's time's expired. Gentleman from Virginia. I, I thank the speaker, and I yield myself 30 seconds. Just in response, Mr. Speaker, to the allegation about those who benefit from the Small Business Tax Cut Act, uh, I would ask uh, the gentleman to perhaps um, look at the language of the Democrat alternative uh, on the motion to recommit because it as well provides the same benefit it's trying to provide to others. Uh, it, all those people, the so-called rich and famous that he says are the only ones Would that benefit, also benefit Would under the their alternative. You? So with that, Mr. Speaker, the I, would say, for a I will not. It, it, with that, Mr. Speaker, I would say, um, you know, we're here to provide the kind of relief to the small businessmen and women uh, that uh, uh, will benefit from this. And with that, I yield two minutes to a gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Black. Gentlewoman from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Leader, for uh, allowing me uh, to be here today. And I have spent the last year and a half uh, traveling throughout the sixth congressional district that I represent, talking to small, medium, and large-sized businesses. And um, what I have asked them is across the board, what is it that would help you to be able to grow your business? And what I hear from them is that they are, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And they are concerned already about large burdens of uh, increasing taxes, more regulations, more mandates. And they really fear what Washington will do to them next. Well, what if, what if we said to small businesses that really are the engine of our economic growth, that we're going to do something for you instead of to you. And um, what if Washington encouraged growth instead of causing small businesses to live in fear that one more tax might sink them? Over 20 years ago, my family started a small business, and I can tell you that if the conditions that are like they are today were like they like they are today were then, we probably would not have taken the risk to put everything on the line and start our small business. And that's why I'm supporting Leader Cantor's 20% small business tax cut that would allow small business owners to, one, retain more capital, two, invest in their business, and three, and this is the key, to hire more workers. In the state of Tennessee, we have over 96,000 small businesses that employ over 1.38 1, um, million individuals. And in particular, we have 12,000 small women-owned businesses, which has been, until recently, the uh, fastest growing sector of our small business uh, economy. And so, it's not just a cliche that getting small business growing again is the key to our economic growth. It's a fact. And I yield back my time. And the lady yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. I yield myself 30 seconds. What the leader said is not correct. The substitute provides some help to those who invest in property, plant, and equipment. That's not Paris Hilton. And also, also, the gentleman yield? No, let me finish. You didn't yield at all to us, so let me finish. So it has to be a factory. It's built here. I yield to the gentleman from California. And I yield myself an additional 30 seconds. So what the gentleman, Mr. Levin, is saying is correct, and I want to correct Mr. Cantor because he misspoke about the Democratic alternative. The Democratic alternative requires that a small business make an investment in plant and machinery. If, if Paris Hilton wishes to invest in plants and machinery, then perhaps you'll qualify. If uh, Larry Flint would want to invest in plants and machinery for his business, perhaps he'd qualify. But otherwise, this is a giveaway Ours requires you to make investments in America. Now I yield. Who's next? I yield two minutes to another distinguished member of our committee, Mr. Neal, from the great state of Massachusetts. 
gentleman from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Mr. Neal. I'm Neal. sorry, from the com I'm from Michigan. The Commonwealth, you're from the state I, of Ohio? I am from the state of Ohio. Mr. Speaker, the I think it's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I think it's the great state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think it's the Whatever the state of, of is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Levin. Mr. Speaker, I stand in opposition to this proposal today. Just a couple of thoughts, having had long-term membership here. This is not the way to write legislation, and the members on the other side, they know this. The Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee should be here with us today to discuss this. This should have been vetted into the full committee. This should have had an active markup with full participation. I revere this institution, and I revere that committee. Members spend their careers trying to become members of the Ways and Means Committee. To bring this legislation to the floor today without a hearing is ill-considered. From a historic perspective, why don't we talk about how we got into this situation? This bill today adds $46 billion to the deficit. Without a hearing? Why don't we just do these proposals by unanimous consent? Bring them to the floor. We missed the point of what the vetting process does where people stand in front of that committee and they offer expert testimony. But our friends on the Republican side they call this a small business tax cut. This is about the theater of the election year, and everybody knows it. This is the same group that would have you believe, incidentally, that tax cuts pay for themselves, even though you can't find an economist who will adhere to that position. They have run up the deficits in this country recklessly, and in the name of a political campaign, they're prepared to do it again. They want to pour syrup on the plate, not even bother to serve pancakes with it. In our current fiscal situation, to have not vetted this sort of proposal in front of the committee is a mistake. You want to talk about helping small business with tax policy? Count me in. Count me in. We've worked on some good bipartisan legislation over the last 20 years to help small businesses. Not to do it in this manner or way that this legislation has been brought to the floor. We had a markup in the committee yesterday. Cuts are being proposed to senior citizens to low-income families, and they want to eliminate funding for wheels, Meals on Wheels, and they bring this proposal up today with a straight face. I yield back the balance of my time. I'm yields back. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself 30 seconds. Uh, just want to set the record straight, Mr. Speaker. Ways and Means Committee uh, had two small business hearings in the implication of tax reform in which this proposal was raised. In addition, the gentleman well knows that there was a markup. Well, the gentleman yield. There, if I could finish, no. Uh, if there was a markup in committee in which even the gentleman offered an amendment, then withdrew it because it was ruled non germane. So, of course, there was a markup. Of course, this idea has been the subject of discussion in committee. Uh, so, again, I just wanted to set the record straight, Mr. Speaker. And with that, uh, I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Biggert. Gentlewoman from Illinois. I thank the majority for, uh, leader for yielding. And Mr. Speaker, uh, Tuesday uh, was tax day when Americans everywhere uh, were reminded just how much Uncle Sam takes out of our pockets each and every year. But it was also a reminder that not all of our tax policies are created equal. Some in Washington want to raise taxes simply to feed the federal government's spending addiction, even when higher taxes on things like capital gains and investments would only discourage growth and shrink revenue in the long term. I think our tax code should be designed to promote simplicity, competition, and economic growth. And we can do this by reducing the burden on small American businesses that are responsible for the majority of new jobs created in our country every day. This bill will provide an immediate 20 percent deduction for millions of small businesses, one-third of which, by the way, are owned by women and one-fifth of which are, are minority-owned. Small, uh, let's allow small businesses to reinvest in new jobs, new opportunities, and new products that will grow our economy. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to listen, as I have done, to the vo voices of their small business owners and operators back home. I yield back. And the lady yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. I ask the distinguished gentleman from the state of Ohio uh, how much time there is on each side. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, uh, from the state of Michigan, has 15 and a half minutes, and the gentleman from Virginia, the majority leader, has 20 and a half. We have 15 and a half? Yes, sir. 
I now yield to a minister, the gentleman from Texas, another active member of our committee, Mr. Doggett. Gentleman from Texas. I thank the gentleman. You know, the Republicans are always so much better in the names they give these bills than what's in them. And I think in considering this one, we have to look at what it is and what it is not. It is not an economic recovery measure. A nonpartisan analysis has shown that the economic benefits are considered to be so small as to be incalculable. It is not helpful to sole proprietors who do not benefit at all from this bill. It is not a way to reduce the deficit or the national debt. Indeed, this is a measure that will add immediately $46 billion to the national deficit. We were told only yesterday that because of a pressing national debt, we can no longer fund hot meals for seniors through the Meals on Wheels program in Texas, that we could not afford to provide federal resources uh, that are necessary there on child abuse or on keeping a child with disability at home or helping a senior maintain their independence, that there just aren't the resources to do that. But today we are told there is $46 billion we can add to the debt for a nice sounding bill. What is this bill? It is another failed Republican retread. It is a measure that will help those at the top rather than those who are really struggling to get at the top. I'm concerned about the ice house on the west side of San Antonio, about the beauty shop in Lockhart, about the auto repair shop in San Marcos. But those are not the places that will receive the principal benefits of this measure. Indeed, 125,000 millionaires in this country will get more in tax benefits out of this than many of the owners of those businesses earn during an entire year. In fact, more than the median income throughout San Antonio and Austin and Central and South Texas. Uh, what this measure is is a boon to highly paid... Do you have another minute? 30 seconds. It will be a boon to highly paid professionals, private equity firms, hedge fund managers, and professional sports teams. I think they've received enough economic benefit in the past with the Bush tax cuts. We ought to be focusing our support for small businesses, not on those who are already at the top and should be contributing a little to the shared sacrifice necessary to get our national debt under control and meet basic human needs. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Virginia. Uh, thank, Ms. thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself 30 seconds. Again, Mr. Speaker, just to correct the record, uh, the gentleman from Texas indicated that this bill doesn't uh, benefit sole proprietors. Sole proprietors are, in fact, the disproportionate beneficiaries under this bill. According to the Joint Tax uh, Committee on Joint Taxation, 17.9, almost 18 million joint uh, sole proprietors benefit under this bill. Again, to set the record straight, Mr. Speaker. And now uh, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, uh, the, uh, not only the chairman of the Subcommittee on Trade, uh, but as well the vice chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, Mr. Brady. Thank you. I want to first thank Leader Cantor for his leadership on economic issues, especially those along Main Street. And that's what this is about. This isn't about Paris Hilton or uh, Larry Flint or even Hillary Rosen, president's uh, top advisor who recently denigrated women who choose to work at home. It's not about celebrities. It's about small business people. They're the ones who've been left behind in the Obama economy. Think about this. We have tens, literally, tens of millions of Americans who can't find a full-time job, millions more who just given up. They, they don't even look for work anymore. Here we are. It's hard to believe. There are fewer Americans working today than when the president took office. Bailouts, stimulus, cash for clunkers, housing bailout, Solyndra bailout, all of that. Fewer Americans working, 700,000 fewer women with a job. Small businesses have borne the brunt of this terrible recovery and it's time we help. Instead of raising taxes on those who succeed, why don't we let them keep 20% more of the income they earn, the sales they make, the weekends they work, the, the charges they put on their credit cards, all they do to survive uh, and succeed in this economy. Republicans are determined to give them a chance to succeed in this, until this economy can get back to work, to hire new workers, to keep new workers. And I have to tell you, 
Um, I remember in Ways and Means Committee the debate on Obamacare, Republicans offered an amendment to, to shield small businesses from tax increases, and our Democratic friends said they can't do that because small businesses have had it too easy all these years. Small businesses have had it too easy all these years. It's time to give our small businesses a break, time to get this economy back on track. It's time to let them keep what they've worked so hard to earn. I yield back. Many yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. I now yield two minutes to another active member, very active member of our committee, Mr. Pasquale from New Jersey. Gentleman from New Mr. Jersey. Uh, Speaker, we are really in the middle of the theater of the absurd. Uh, I'm not opposed, and apparently the other side's not opposed, to stimulus spending for the economy. But I don't know where they've been for the last 18 months. Let's make effective st stimulus. Since you mentioned the CBO, Mr. Cantor, through the chair, they rank this bill next to last in bang for the buck in job creation. You didn't quote CBO about that. And through the speaker, the Joint Committee on Taxation said that the economic impact is so small as to be incalculable. Your own analysis on your website is very clear. It's going to cost, add 1.1 million for every job created to the deficit. I rise in strong opposition to this legislation. Just yesterday, in order to comply with the majority's budget that violates the deal Mr. Uh, Speaker Boehner agreed to last year, that deal is clear, public. The Ways and Means Committee cut $53 billion in health care tax credits, child tax credits, social services block credits. You cut it yesterday for the disabled, for the elderly who are most vulnerable. In New Jersey, they could lose millions of dollars for Meals on Wheels, foster care. This is unacceptable. We're voting to add $47 billion to the deficit today with a giveaway to professional sports teams. Oh, you didn't know that. Or hedge fund operators or managers, whatever they call themselves, and multi-million dollar partnerships and corporations. Yes, $47 billion goes to 125,000 millionaires, but each of them gets a tax cut, Mr. Speaker, of $60,000. This is wrong. The same report found that the best options for job growth include aid to states and increased safety net spending, something I know that the other side opposes. In fact, the Agricultural Committee just voted yesterday to cut food stamps, get this, by $34 billion. Like all of those people on food stamps want to be on food stamps. All those people that are poor want to be poor. And that's your anthem. But it can't find reality. It has no foundation. And it is immoral. Immoral. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman and ask all members to heed the gavel. The gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from South Dakota. Ms. Noam. Gentlewoman from South Dakota. I thank the leader for yielding. You know, it never ceases to amaze me, uh, the misleading claims that will come from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle at times. One of them that has been talked about a lot here today is the fact that only the rich and famous would benefit from this piece of legislation. Well, I've been sitting back here and I've been trying to think of uh, even a handful of famous people in South Dakota that are going to benefit from this. I can't come up with it, but I've got over 20,000 jobs in the state of South Dakota and 20,000 different businesses that are going to benefit from this piece of legislation, and that's why I'm supporting it. My constituents in South Dakota so many times only look at government uh, as an entity that costs them money and makes it very detrimental and hard for them to succeed. Uh, when the government can actually step in and do something that makes it easier for them to succeed and help drive that success, 
uh, then that is something we should be behind. And that's why the small business tax cut is a perfect example of that situation. Small businesses create jobs, and they also uh, employ almost half of all the private sector employees in this country. This bill is going to free up the cash so that those small businesses can keep people employed when they've hit tough times and maybe reinvest in their businesses. It's a Big key to I what we need to do, and I hope we can all come together and support this good legislation before us. Gentlemen, ladies, time has expired. Gentlemen from Michigan. I now yield two minutes to another distinguished member of our committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Crowley. Gentleman from New York. I, I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman, my friend from Michigan, for yielding me this time. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to this bill. There are a number of reasons to oppose this, this legislation. One, this bill is not targeted towards job creation. Frankly, it is not targeted at all. It will provide 99.6% of all businesses with a tax break, regardless of whether or not they create one American job or not. Two, this bill does not prevent businesses from taxing a, taking a tax cut even when they lay off workers. Three, this bill fails to help the businesses most in need, such as new businesses or startups. They're not eligible for any provisions in this bill. Fourth, this bill will add billions to the deficit, which will hurt economic growth in America. Five, and most egregiously, this bill provides companies who are in the midst of offshoring jobs with a tax break. During committee consideration of this legislation, I offered an amendment to deny this tax deduction to any company that reduces the number of American workers and jobs while correspondingly increasing in foreign workforce. Additionally, the amendment stated if a company offshores U.S. jobs next year after this one-year tax expenditure expires, the funds would be recaptured or taken back by the Treasury. This is so a company cannot take the money this year and run away with American dollars and jobs next year and put them overseas. My amendment enjoyed the support of every Democrat on the Committee on Ways and Means. Unfortunately, it was not supported by one Republican on that committee. Americans and their taxpayer dollars should not be subsidizing the destruction of American jobs. Let me state, Democrats recognize we live in a global economy. We recognize that many of our companies need to operate internationally to remain competitive and expand their markets and market share. But Americans should not have their hard-earned tax dollars, $46 billion in this case, Mr. Speaker, taken away and used to subsidize this kind of business activity. Democrats worked hard while in the majority... Can I have 15 additional seconds? You an additional 15 seconds. Democrats worked hard while in the majority to end the practice of incentivizing of the offshoring of U.S. jobs in the tax code. We killed a number of perverse tax loopholes and reinvested the revenue into initiatives focused on creating U.S. jobs and assisting America's small businesses. Defeat this bill. It is immoral. We should not be spending U.S. tax dollars in this way, and yield back the balance of my time. How much time has expired, gentlemen from Virginia? Th uh, thank you, Ms. Figger. I yield myself 30 seconds. Just to respond to the gentleman, I think he put his finger on the problem here. The problem with his kind of amendment is the problem with the tax code today, because it means that if you're a business, you, under his rule, you'd have to come to Washington to seek eligibility for a tax break or seek eligibility for a tax favor. And if you're on the approved list in Washington, then you can go and benefit and have an advantage over others. That's not what we believe. We believe in helping all small businesses. And, and with that, I would yield, Mr. Speaker, two minutes to the gentleman, the Small Business Committee Chairman, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Graves. The gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tax season reminds us that small businesses are disproportionately affected by tax compliance and high tax rates. The Small Business Administration reports that the average tax compliance cost per employee for small businesses is almost three times the cost of larger firms. And according to the NAFIB, tax issues are the single most significant set of regulatory burdens for most small firms. The Small Business Tax Deduction Act is simple, fair, and gives small businesses access to badly needed capital to invest in their companies while providing just a little more certainty to help them plan for the future. As chairman of the Small Business Committee, I hear from small business owners every single week about their regulatory and tax burdens. And through our interactive web, web page, Small Business Open Mic, we have heard that tax policies may drive some small firms out of business. 
On Tuesday, Wendy Kohler, owner of Kohler Mowing and Storage in Fort Smith, Arkansas, said, and I quote, we're hesitant to hire new employees for fear of what new tax burdens await us with the expiration of the older law and the new health care laws coming. We're concerned that these new issues may be the ones that push us out of business. Last Saturday, Debbie Peacock, owner of a fabricating distributor company in Mesa, Arizona, wrote, and I quote, any additional taxes will only stop any chance of recovery, and the government needs to realize we need every penny to increase staff, which puts people back to work. You know, I can go on and on and on about examples like these. Yesterday, our committee held a hearing on the flood of new taxes that are just around the corner, such as new taxes from the health care law and the massive tax increase that's going to occur if the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts expire. All of these measures could send the economy into a tailspin, costing thousands of jobs. That's why the Small Business Tax Deduction Act is necessary and is going to provide that tax relief for America's most robust job creators. With that, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask that my colleagues support this bill and I yield back the balance of my time. I'm going to yield back, gentleman from Michigan. I now yield three minutes to the ranking member of the Budget Committee. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen. Gentleman from Maryland, for three minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Mr. Levin. Uh, Mr. Speaker, here we go again. Uh, this pro bill provides a windfall tax break to hedge fund owners, to big Washington law firms, to the very wealthy, even, even if they don't hire a single person, not one. In fact, in a cruel hoax and twist on this, wealthy individuals can qualify for this tax break even if they fire people this year. And in some cases, they can also get a bigger tax break if they do not make their investments this year. That's why the nonpartisan Joint Tax Committee, and Mr. Speaker, this, this place sometimes gets to be a fact-free zone. We have the nonpartisan Joint Tax Committee say, and I quote, the economic activity generated by this is so small as to be incalculable. That's why Bruce Bartlett, former economic advisor to President Reagan, said, and I quote, it will do nothing whatsoever to increase employment, unquote. So what's this all about? It gives a big tax break to the wealthiest individuals while adding $50 billion, about $50 billion to our deficit and debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, this week highlights the unfortunate doublespeak from our Republican colleagues when it comes to the deficit. On the Senate side, a majority of Republicans voted against a bill to apply the Buffett rule, meaning that we were going to ask millionaires to pay the same effective tax rate as many as their employees paid and use that $50 billion toward deficit reduction. Here in the House, we're providing a $50 billion tax break that adds to the deficit, and this one is targeted disproportionately to very wealthy individuals. There's another sort of strange irony here. When we were debating the payroll tax cut for a year that would benefit 160 million Americans, our Republican colleagues dragged their feet, and then they said this was all a, a gimmick. It was a one-year thing. It was a sugar high. Well, at least the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office said that it would generate active, economic activity. In fact, they ranked it near the top. This is a one-year thing that's going to give a great sugar high to the wealthiest individuals. Man, they are going to be floating on this. But it's ranked near the bottom by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office in terms of economic activity. You want to know another irony? When it came to providing a tax break for 160 million Americans' payroll tax cut, we, we paid for it. We offset the costs of that when it comes to providing a sugar-high $50 billion tax cut that disproportionately benefits the wealthy, we don't offset it. We put it on our national credit card. We increase the debt. Who pays for that? We've heard on a bipartisan basis that's our kids, our grandkids. We're all going to be paying for that debt. So, Mr. Speaker, this is worse than a gimmick. It's not good for the economy. It adds to the deficit, uh, and I urge that uh, we reject the uh, bill. Time has time's expired. Gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Camp, be permitted to control the balance of the time. Without objection. The chair would uh, advise that the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, now controls 14 and a half minutes, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, has five and one quarter minutes. <coughs>
gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Louisiana. Gentleman from Louisiana. Thank the gentleman from Michigan for yielding, and I rise in support of the small business tax cut. You know, in Louisiana alone, we'll see 80,000 small businesses that will be able to benefit from this and over 890,000 workers that will benefit from this. Uh, yet my colleagues on the Democrat side uh, maybe think that it's, it's their money. They don't want those small businesses to be able to keep it, and they think that Washington can spend it better than the small businesses. You know, and how's that worked out, by the way? Uh, they don't want small businesses to be able to keep some more of the hard-earned money that they make so they can invest it in their business. They'd rather keep it up here for critical Washington spending like the $535 million they blew on Solyndra or maybe the $850,000 that Obama's GSA blew on the Vegas junkets. That's the kind of things that they would rather see, and so they don't want those small businesses to be able to keep more of their hard-earned money. They want to keep taxing businesses. They've had over $1.9 trillion of new taxes in President Obama's own budget. We've tried it their way. More than 2 million Americans have lost their jobs since President Obama took office. How about we actually try letting small businesses keep more of their hard-earned